talking about more than three dimensions, which obviously cannot be visualized, uh, but it is possible, right? So my question for the readers is, what would be the exact name of uh, an n-dimensional object, right? So you have 1D, 2D, uh, 1D is just a point, there is nothing, 2D is area, 3D is volume. 4D is something else. And similarly, what happens to when I extend this to n dimensions, right? So that is just a question for the readers to ponder about. Right, okay. And uh, this is actually an interesting, another viewpoint of viewing uh, 3D printing, right? In in uh, in maybe in M1 or in 11th and 12th, what we used to do is, we used to find out the volume by integrating we used to find out volume of uh, figures by integrating. And what is integration? Integration means you have thin slices or uh, thin layers, right? Uh, thin layers. And you stack these layers on top of each other so that uh, a volume or an enclosure gets formed, right? And I just mentioned that stacking is something that uh, 3D printing uh, does. So in order, may I, uh, in other words, maybe or maybe not, maybe we can view 3D printing as sort of an integral operator, right? Maybe integral is essentially something that adds up stuff, right? You integrate to, uh, to, give, to get volume. You don't differentiate to get volume. When you differentiate, you divide it into infinitesimal parts. But you, when you integrate it, uh, you combine small slices to, to get volume, right? So maybe that is one another way of viewing uh, 3D printing. Right, so coming to the actual uh, mechanical or the engineering definition of 3D printing, uh, well, uh, I wouldn't want to say what is the exact definition, but I would want you all to stick with the stacking up definition. So uh, this American Society of Testing and Materials, uh, they are the official uh, guide providers for 3D printing processes. So currently there are seven official uh, types of 3D printing processes and I'll just focus on one process alone because as I said, this is not a 3D printing lecture and nor a machine learning lecture. So this is the common 3D printing process that everyone sees and uh, um, it will be even more clearer in just a second. So this is known as uh, fused deposition modeling. And what happens is you have a material and nowadays it can be any material from plastics to metal. So what it happens is it goes through this chamber and this material gets uh, molten uh, and it gets heated up and it gets molten into a liquid form. And that uh, semi-amorphous or the semi-solid state liquid is being stacked on top of each other to form 3D objects, right? And when I say this, it actually sounds fancy, but when I show this GIF, then we all would uh, probably realize that uh, and this is actually the fused deposition modeling process. This is commonly seen uh, everywhere across uh, the websites and every, every uh, shop that we see, every company that is trying to scam us uh, by wanting us to join 3D printing courses. Well, they, they'll just describe this image and uh, uh, ask you 10,000 rupees for just one hour. So those are uh, the typical um, uh, 3D printing processes uh, that you normally encounter, they all refer to this thing called as fused deposition modeling. So, okay, I know about 3D printing and what are the steps involved in uh, 3D printing. I'll go uh, one by one, right? So initially, since this is a computerized uh, design or a computerized uh, process, you need to have a design of the 3D model that you're going to make and you import that design into a specific software that divides the 3D design into small 2D slices. Remember the, the talk that we had about stacking up of 2D objects. That is exactly how uh, 3D printing is done. So it is stacking up, say, two-dimensional circles or something like that uh, in order to get this cylinderish shape, right? So you need to slice that and uh, softwares and the models uh, does that for you and you give um, that information back to the machine and uh, a curious point is that the machine setup actually is uh, extremely different for the seven different processes they are actually uh, similar in some aspects but widely different when we look at it from a non-engineer or a non-3d printing guy's 
point of view and you set up the machine and yes this is the final part you actually start the printing process and when you get uh, the object out um, you can do whatever you want right so that is uh, entirely up to, uh, to the application of what 3d printing is so sometimes um, when i talk about post processing say for example you get a 3d printed part without any colors and you want to give it a beautiful coating of say red and black color so you paint the part right that is uh, post processing and uh, in other in in, in other parts uh, you would want to sort of uh, increase uh, how strong the part is. So what you would do is uh, you would uh, make the part undergo some serious uh, transformations. Like for example, you would heat the part so that it would behave in a certain manner that you would want to behave. So those are sort of the um, post-processing techniques that are widely employed, right? Coming to uh, the second part. So uh, the first part is about uh, 3D printing. And uh, that uh, small definition is for the people who are not that familiar with 3D printing. And uh, this part is the exciting part, uh, in my opinion, for the current audience. So what exactly is machine learning? And uh, I have kept it in uh, simpler terms so that uh, 3D printing enthusiasts would appreciate what machine learning is. And uh, this is also quite interesting for the computer science people to see what exactly is the point of view of uh, someone who is typically in, say, uh, other departments, per se, right? So there are lots and lots of official definitions, unofficial definitions, uh, YouTube definitions out there, but this is the definition that uh, I would like to have, right? So 3D printing is essentially a simple computer algorithm that finds out the relationship between an input and an output, right? That As simple as, that, uh, as, it, as this gets, right? So... Um, this is sort of an overused image and that might have been encountered by the computer science people. So for the non-computer science people, traditionally what uh, we would be doing is we would have a certain set of rules and uh, we have a certain set of inputs and we give the input and uh, we obey uh, the rules for that input in order to get an output. Say, for example, uh, if I have to play a chess move, I need I, I know that the rules for the uh, chess pawn is that it can only move forwards in a single step. So that is the rule based input and output. So, uh, well, th that is sort of the conventional way of looking at things. Uh, things, and I'll I'll actually come to this a little later. And uh, the other way of looking at uh, things is what uh, machine learning does is so you have a series of inputs and outputs and you don't know what is the relationship between them and machine learning exactly does that so that is as simple as or i would say a simpler definition of machine learning for starters carrying on from that definition we know that when something finds the relationship between input and output it is called as a function um, I mean, uh, both the audience would have heard this term in their 11th and 12th classes. And in fact, in almost all of the uh, engineering subjects, be it computer science or uh, um, um, mechanical engineering or any other dep uh, departments. So a function is something that displays the relationship between input and output. So typically, we, know, we denote that as follows. So Y is the output x is the input and the function it denotes that okay uh, it shows that okay there exists some relationship between y and x but we don't know what that is if i have to elaborate that clearly uh, let's look at the first graph so y equals to x is uh, the relationship given for this graph so which is essentially the ever famous uh, linear relationship which says that as x increases y increases as x decreases y um, decreases and the the one down below is um, again sort of a non-linear relationship where uh, essentially this is called as an upward open parabola where uh, x increases in double the value as y uh, oscillates from uh, uh, right, so uh, so that that is one way of saying. So, what what exactly is a functional fit? Uh, can can also be explained uh, by giving a practical example. Say, for example, when I was studying for REC, uh, say for example, if I get uh, low marks, marks is a, marks is my input. I would be sad, 
right? But if I get very high marks, I would be very happy. So uh, that uh, relationship between input and output is, is somewhat of a, uh, a linear relationship, right? So uh, so that is quite uh, easy to predict. But say for, for example, there is uh, this person in my class who is an S grader, right? Uh, we all know how S graders are. So S graders, they, they are actually quite sad for almost all the marks that they get below average marks. And they only start to get happy when they get above, uh, say, 85 to 90, right? So this is <laughs> the functional representation of an S grader getting marks typically. And this is the functional representation of an average student like me uh, getting marks, right? This is just, uh, I would say, an, uh, uh, just a fun visualization of what functions are so yes right okay so um so uh, when i say learning what what exactly does learning mean uh, in machine learning this is uh, more emphasized by me um, taking a point of the definition like this so the machine learning algorithm would typically tell you give me more input and output data i'll find the relationship between them so the learning is actually uh, getting and the machine learning algorithm getting more and more data right and if i have to slightly deviate from the above definition in more of mathematical sense i would define the process of finding relationship between input and output data when they are given is as curve fitting right let me just give an uh, a solid uh, example say for example um, i have uh, this data and i also have uh, this data and we all know we have two data points what is the uh, how do we join the two data points say using a straight line say assume that this is a straight line but it it unfortunately happens to be uh, that i am actually unaware that there are uh, data here too so this is the actual data that I wasn't actually given. So, which would mean that this straight line uh, representation of mine was actually wrong. So, what I need to do is, uh, since I have more data, I can accurately draw this sort of a curve shape. In other words, an exponential e power x curve. So, that correctly fits my data even more better. So, the more data points you have, typically more accurate uh, the machine learning algorithm would try to fit the curve. The process of giving more data so that the curve would be accurately fitted by machine learning is the actual learning in, in my books of <clears throat> definition. So this is just uh, an example of data being um, fitted by the curve. So if I have to... Uh, point out say for example assume assume let uh, i'll let it finish so assume that you have this point here and this point here alone we all know two points means a uh, straight line right but this is 100 percent not a straight line some sort of a graph with uh, uh, say two peaks right so uh, that is why more the data you have uh, more accurate uh, it should perform but there are chances that uh, it might not perform too so the computer science students might have heard this numerous times so in order to explain this uh, in, in simpler words overfitting uh, if i take the example of uh, marks versus happiness overfitting is actually me overthinking say for example if i don't score well uh, if i don't score well in that 10 mark question 30 years from now uh, i would not be earning much that is overfitting you're overthinking too much and underfitting is I don't care about the marks at all. Uh, marks don't define me. I'm not that sort of a person. So that is underfitting, right? An optimum fit would be, uh, yes, I need to score marks so that I could get good grades. None of the overfitting and underfitting actually talked about the grades. One guy, the overfitting guy, talked about his family problem that would happen 30 years from now. <laughs> that is overestimating, right? And the underfitting uh, doesn't even care about the grade at all, right? So an optimum guy would be say, uh, okay, I need to score this much so that I can be happy with the grades that I get, right? So that is essentially uh, the crux of curve fitting. Uh, yes. Uh, so essentially, if if you are if you are good enough, you can provide optimal fits. And uh, if you want to uh, cunningly lie to your classmates, you can either overfit or underfit cleverly, right? That is totally up to you. Okay, so the types of uh, uh, machine learning, um, according to me, 
a, 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 a mechanical engineering student per se. Right? Okay, I'll first talk about uh, regression. And I will be using the term functional fit or relationship because that is how I defined machine learning uh, in the first place. So a uh, regression is the process of obtaining the relationship between input and output with the conditions. An input is a numerical input. An output must be a continuous numerical output. I'll make, uh, I'll, I'll actually explain this uh, in, in the following sense, right? So here uh, is an example of a regression and the famous old age versus income output. And uh, when I say continuous numerical output, income can be any number, right? So there is no restriction on a number say for example you cannot say that uh, income can only take uh, 10000 and 20000 as values it cannot it can never take uh, any other values because i can uh, immediately say that it is wrong i can provide a job description that says income as uh, 15000 for 23 years right so uh, in order to explain this in uh, in an even more subtle way what the relationship does is it takes a data point from the input, right? And that data point is actually lying in the real number line because age again can, can uh, is a continuous numerical input. And it takes this data point from the input and it relates this data point to the data point that is available in the output. And how is that data point? It actually again real, uh, lies on a real number line. and. Uh, uh, this will even uh, be clearer when I explain the classification example. So the classification, as one might have guessed, the sort of a discrete numerical output and uh, the ever famous uh, example of uh, given the temperature, uh, if I have to predict if it's a disease or not a disease, then that is the classical uh, classification example. And uh, the computer science students might have already figured that this is the classical uh, logistic regression. And uh, here, here is the catchphrase, right? So the input uh, is temperature. Temperature can be anything, right? So it, it is just a numerical value. It can be 30, it can be 31, it can be 30.1, it can be 30.1.5, it depends, right? It depends on the accuracy of the instrument. But however, the output cannot take uh, more than one value because that is how I have defined my outputs. It's either disease or not disease. So I would associate uh, uh, not disease as zero and I would associate disease as one. So the output can only take uh, two values. And uh, this is a binary classification problem. I can similarly um, uh, portray multi-class classification problem. So I can add zero, one, two, three, etc. right? And for the computer science students, this is, uh, me talking about the one hot vector, right? And uh, for the non-computer science students, that is just me assigning more than uh, uh, more numbers, right? Uh, more discrete numbers in this uh, real number line. So what this function does is it takes this guy, this uh, input guy from the number line. This input guy is actually lying comfortably in the real number line. And it maps, it relates uh, this input guy to either this guy over here or that guy over here. It cannot, it can never go in between, right? Because that is how I defined the function in itself. So this is essentially the classification problem. And for those of you wondering, yes, I will give back to supervised versus unsupervised later. This is just a brief um, explanation of regression versus classification. Right, coming to the main topic, uh, it is it is actually quite amusing that I enter my main topic after 25 odd minutes, right? <laughs> so, what essentially mean uh, uh, is meant when I say machine learning for 3D printing. Simple. Uh, we have to build uh, the explanation based on what we have seen earlier. We use machine learning algorithms, and uh, I'll actually interchangeably use ML and machine learning just for the uh, sake of uh, clarity. So machine learning algorithms are being used to find out relationships between inputs and outputs of 3D printing processes. That's it. That is, in my opinion, the simplest definition of what goes on. So this actually begs the next question. What exactly are the inputs and output for 3D printing processes? Uh, this is actually uh, extremely difficult to answer because as I mentioned, there are seven different types of 3D printing processes and one process alone can uh, have say 
at least uh, 100 different class of inputs and outputs, right? So this is not an easy question to answer. And hence, that is why I took only one process for you guys so that I can explain uh, what qualifies as input and output for 3D printing process. But generally speaking, going back to the original slide, this is the 3D printing workflow, right? So you have uh, the creation of the initial design, and you also have uh, the slicing up of the design. You have the machine setup. Say, as I mentioned earlier, for the fuse deposition modeling, the setup would be uh, you uh, maintaining the nozzle cleanly so that the nozzle deposits uh, you, making sure that the code is being correctly sent into the machine right so those are the setups and the actual printing and the actual pre-processing the the best thing is the in, uh, you can you can randomly pick input and output quantities of interest from this entirety of the workflow right say for example you can print, uh, pick an input uh, in the design stage and uh, you can print uh, you can pick an output in the final stage and since to, to your typical machine learning algorithm they are nothing just but uh, a bunch of numbers all it does is it fits the relationship between the input and output right so uh, this is why we have to be actually clear that what we uh, uh, what we analyze is something good say for example uh, i cannot randomly assign uh, CAD design as uh, my 3D printing input uh, and output is uh, me being happy or not. It actually makes sense to me, right? Uh, if I make good designs, I might be happy, but we also have to uh, be aware uh, what it makes sense in a commercial manner, right? So in order to give uh, an example, so I would like to uh, encourage the readers to look at this uh, typical machine. Right, so you have this uh, interesting machine with the one element, uh, one one uh, material coming through it, and it is forming this nice shape. So if I have to define what might be the potential inputs and outputs are, see the potential input might be the type of uh, material given to print. Right, so uh, say for example, we all know uh, even for the and uh, this is for the non uh, computer science. Uh, uh, sorry, this is for the non-mechanical engineering uh, people, right? So we all know an aluminum plate is different from a brass plate and uh, aluminum plate is different from a silver plate, even by the looks and appearance of, of that. So that can be a potential input and potential output, again, uh, say, I'll, I'll give two examples, right? So potential output is, does the final print look good or bad, right? So say, for example, uh, a silver uh, vessel will look extremely good and hence that is why we prefer silver vessels on uh, marriage functions right you don't prefer the rusty old iron vessels or that brass uh, vessels right so uh, so carry over the same example here uh, different types of input materials might might make the uh, print look good or bad. And the next is the uh, characteristics uh, uh, of the material itself or the regression problem. Say, for example, if you have a, a material, um, say this material has a characteristics called the weight, right? Say, for example, I uh, I'm sure that uh, each of you would have different mobile phones and each of the mobile phones would vary differently. Uh, you would uh, say that, okay, this is made of uh, stainless steel. That is why it weighs less. And this is uh, made of uh, some composites, extremely good plastic. So that is why it weighs even more or less, right? So uh, that is the characteristics that every material would have. If I have to be a little bit more technical, uh, what is the tensile strength of this material? In other words, what is the uh, strength capability of this material uh, under uh, different materials, uh, uh, right? So, and if I have to elaborate, uh, as I mentioned first, uh, a typical machine learning problem would be, what is the type of input material versus uh, whether the print would look good or bad, right? So if I have to be a little bit more technical, uh, re revisiting this um, uh, image where the material actually gets molten and gets stacked on, on top of each other, one potential input could be this temperature, right? And uh, the potential output would be how fast the material flows. We all know that a solid material doesn't even flow. So in order for a material to flow, you need to melt it. And uh, 
uh, how much melt or how effective a melting is is dep uh, de uh, actually depends on how hot the material is when i speak about hot there you go you uh, you talk about temperature right so and uh, the same argument can be elaborated for again and uh, a defective or, or non defective parts let's say for example you heat the material to a lesser extent than what it should have been so you might uh, get uh, some abnormalities right so that is again one other way of uh, defining um, this so uh, followingly uh, i present an, an exa example that i found out on the literature and unfortunately i cannot uh, share the work that i did for my company due to the nda so um, i'm so yes uh, right okay so this is one of the papers right who used uh, this exact uh, fdm uh, process and what uh, they want to observe uh, or what is the input is the temperature right the temp the temperature that happens here so uh, and how do you capture temperature uh, you have to use uh, temperature capturing devices or sensors and what what is the output uh, you want to find out whether uh, the material gets struck uh, on the nozzle end or not so that is kind of uh, 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 can be defined as clogging so when uh, a clog happens uh, uh, at the nozzle end uh, since uh, clogging uh, of uh, semi or molten material happens at the nozzle end molten material would have abnormally high temperature so you can say that uh, some sort of uh, temperature abnormalities observed in the sensors means that some clogging is actually happening right so this is essentially a uh, sort of the input uh, and the output that were uh, proposed by these people and an interesting fact to note is how difficult it is to actually get the data in order to do your machine learning algorithm right so uh, on on a whole this is this machine learning and this 3d printing setup looks quite compact and good but when you start adding the sensor things get crazy right and you also need to have proper computing devices and the sensors eventually themselves need to be good in order for them uh, to correctly measure right so a main problem or the challenge for um, uh, using implementing machine learning is how you get the data. It isn't quite easy because uh, 3D printing is sort of a newly uh, uh, claiming technology, and it might on indeed there is no guarantee that uh, this uh, this would behave as you would expect. You would uh, have abnormal uh, uh, happenings, etc., so on and so forth. So getting the data is one thing, and uh, secondly uh, is uh, processing pre-processing the, the, the data is another thing, right? So there, might, there are chances where you might have different kinds of inputs. Say, for example, you might have image inputs and uh, you might have uh, uh, temperature inputs. So temperatures are essentially scalars and uh, images can essentially be uh, uh, a vector or a tensor, right? So you have uh, two different set of inputs and uh, you need to cleverly normalize them so that uh, you can make sense of that right and uh, and for the curious people uh, wanting to know what machine learning algorithm was achieved was used to achieve this relationship between output and input they used uh, sort of a uh, encoder system where <clears throat> and the ml algorithm was developed and what uh, they did is they initially started the print and uh, they started observing uh, the, the temperatures, right? So that is how uh, they train uh, the data. So they run the machine or they run the experiments in order to get the data, right? So that is why I said getting data isn't uh, that easy. Normally, uh, we would uh, refer to internet sources, something like uh, GitHub or archive to get our data. But in 3D printing, since this is an emerging technology, you have to manually run the experiments to get the data. and uh, most of the times, the experiment, experiment themselves uh, uh, can be quite challenging, right? So this is why. Uh, so uh, mind, be mindful that this is one of the easily available commercial processes. Uh, uh, the pro the process that I work for called as metal additive manufacturing, three D printing. Uh, people would here relate. Uh, uh, is ex 
extremely complex, quite nasty to work with. You have a huge machine that is double the size of you and it, it is and it is maintained inside a vacuum chamber. So getting all the sensors inside there is extremely difficult and hence data capturing, capturing is one of the most difficult tasks, right? Right, okay, so uh, the next question that begs is, why do we need machine learning for 3D printing? So what I uh, defined is we use machine learning algorithms to find out relationships between inputs and outputs of 3D printing process. But you might ask me, okay, uh, what about the conventional way of finding the inputs, the traditional way, are they really that bad so that I have to use machine learning algorithms? Uh, you haven't seen uh, people using machine learning in, in traditional manufacturing, right? So uh, why, why is that the case in additive manufacturing? That is actually a good question. So the thing is, we do have theories uh, to govern the inputs and the outputs. And the problem is those theories are extremely difficult to implement. Right, so uh, the hint about the theory are that they are essentially differential equations which needs to be solved. Say, for example, if you need to find uh, information about the temperature, I'll actually show you what kind of a differential equation you need to solve, right? So the theory that maps the input uh, for uh, FDM or fused deposition modeling, I'll, I'll show you that. A little reminder for the readers is that solving a differential equation gives the functional fit, right? So essentially what a machine learning algorithm does is it doesn't solve any differential equation at all. It uh, estimates the functional fit without solving the differential equation. But what our theory suggests is that we need to solve these differential equations in order to get the relationship. And what are these differential equations? They are the ever famous Navier-Stokes differential equations. And for, for uh, people here wondering what uh, they are, uh, you have every right to wonder. Because the reason why I pointed out this uh, differential equation is because uh, they govern the flow, the fluid flow of uh, that 3D printing process. Uh, when you have a molten fluid and uh, the fluid needs to flow, and that flow of fluid is governed by the Navier-Stokes equations. Another example of governing equation is the Ohm's law that we all studied in our school, right? Uh, that law states how voltage varies according uh, uh, with current for a given resistance, right? And uh, the, the problem with this is the differential equations in real time, the, I mean, this is not as simple as this. In real time, it can be only solved approximately by using softwares. And solving this, is, that is actually computationally expensive. For my master's thesis, um, I solved one uh, such differential equation on a parallel H uh, and on parallel computing, right? HPCs, which the computer engineers might be well aware of. And uh, it took me six hours to solve a single problem. So that is just me solving my master's thesis on a commercial level. And the simulation would take at least one week, right? On industry scale. So uh, th that, is the extent of computational uh, cost for this uh, differential equation. And uh, <laughs> this is the funny thing, many differential equations like this exist to define various other 3D printing processes. So do I solve this enormous, ugly looking differential equation or do I do that? I, why, why not just conduct simple experiments? All I need to do is spend some initial uh, investment to buy the sensors and uh, you, you have the tools now you have python matlab etc etc even excel does it and uh, that gives you a simple fit right so that is where machine learning plays a pivotal role and for those of you wondering the beauty of this equation uh, if you actually try to prove the smoothness of this differential equation, smoothness is an essential characteristics, characteristic of functions, right? So smoothness actually defines how sensitive uh, your equation is, or in other words, how sensitive you are uh, if you are, if you someone if someone hits you. If someone hits you with a baseball bat, you would be charging at them with your own bat. But if someone hits you with a, a minute pencil, would, would you go mad? That is exactly what uh, smoothness does. So if you actually solve the smoothness of this differential equation, you have $1 million waiting for you, right? So this is essentially part of the million dollar problem that you all might be aware of. 
So, so this is for um, the um, uh, the mechanical engineering side of talking. And if I have to speak this in sort of a, the other way of uh, speaking, this can be analog to a n uh, to a np complete problem which is again uh, brings back the debate of the ever famous p versus np in the million dollar question right so yes so to recollect uh, what is machine learning there you go and what is machine learning for 3d printing machine learning algorithm tries to find out the relationship between inputs and outputs of 3D printing process, rather than me referring to my physics and uh, computer, uh, chemistry textbooks, right? So uh, that is where machine learning works. Uh, when I have these huge fancy differential equations that I don't want to solve, I would uh, prefer uh, 3D uh, machine learning, right? So I would actually present a comparison from my point of view so that user, uh, the viewers could understand it much better. So first I'll talk about machine learning. Uh, it finds out the relationship between inputs and outputs, age versus income, uh, temp uh, material versus good or bad 3D printed part, right? So this model, it gives us the relationship based on experimental data alone. So this is actually an important point because uh, when you study machine learning, say for example, for all the people who has done machine learning, you import data from uh, the libraries, right? Say for example, you, you talk about uh, flowers, right? You want to classify flowers. Do you actually study the biology involved uh, which uh, and talks about flowers? No, you don't. You, don't, you, you never touch the biology or do you study uh, the mechanism of CT scan when you have to solve a COVID case, right? No, you don't uh, go at all. So what you do is you just get the data and do some predictions. That is exactly a machine learning model. So, but since you don't have the domain knowledge, there might be chances that you might uh, underestimate or overestimate as uh, shown, shown <clears throat> previous. Right, so a theory based model is actually quite uh, uh, exact in, in the first part. It actually finds out the relationship uh, between input and output, but this relationship is uh, derived from an extensive theory, for example, uh, Ohm's law relationship for 11th and 12th. We studied, right, uh, and uh, as I showed for the um, uh, FDM process, this is the theory. This large, huge, ugly, but beautiful equation is the theory, right? So uh, this theory is often referred to as uh, physics informed. A short disclaimer, this is what uh, is known, uh, would uh, later be referred to as uh, in, in physics informed neural networks, right? So you have the domain knowledge, which I'll actually talk about in the upcoming slides, right? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> going on from that uh, definition, um, I would propose, say, for example, you have a uh, your your uh, you have a three D printer and you want to implement machine learning, and say uh, you are someone who knows a lot about three uh, D printing, right? Or you are someone who has an expert friend with you who knows a lot about three D printing, right? So the temperature uh, of the nozzle is the input and you have uh, a sensor uh, uh, that sensor is very good and you know how the sensor works and the strength of the final part uh, is the output. You know that uh, uh, the strength uh, varies of, uh, based on the temperature. So the goal is to map or find out the relationship between uh, uh, output and input. Output is Y, input is X. So say, for example, assume, right, uh, the machine learning algorithm first assumes, right, uh, uh, and this is, uh, <clears throat> this is totally different from the solution of a differential equation that we would get. The solution of a differential equation, um, as I showed here, when you solve a differential equation, you get uh, the function. That is the actual solution. But what the machine learning does is it, uh, it doesn't uh, want to do that. Uh, it doesn't want to solve differential equations. So it randomly assumes, right? So it randomly assumes uh, uh, a function, right? Uh, uh, where Y is the strength, X uh, is the input, uh, uh, the temperature. And uh, it has to guess Y1 and Y2 uh, so that uh, 
<clears throat> the uh, the fit would be good right and uh, the domain expert comes to you and says or you know by yourself that this material is quite one of the uh, strongest materials that is available in the entire country so, so you know you know this constraint that uh, the strength of the final part should be extremely good because you know how the material is being manufactured right uh, and your friend tells you oh this is such an extremely good material so the output strength that you should be getting no matter what happens should be extremely high right so when i say that uh, i want the viewers to have a look at this equation right uh, the strength is y and if y has to be high sort of signifies that w1 and w2 should be high too so uh, say for example if y is in the range of uh, 1 lakh right i cannot have my w1 and w2 to be something like 0 0.05 uh, the values of uh, typical uh, weights that uh, computer science people would uh, typically encounter right so yeah, what w1 and w2 cannot be 0.1 or something like that they have to be exceptionally large because we know that the strength has to be extremely large right so this means that the value of w1 and w2 should be very high what so this is the guidance that i need to provide to avoid over and under fitting right so this should be remembered by the people who wants to uh, implement machine learning for 3d printing right so this is the guidance that you provide so that uh, your your uh, relationship is actually logical right uh, and the, the beautiful way of looking at this is in terms of probability and uh, <clears throat> Uh, the way how we can actually see that is, uh, say I provide uh, the constraint, right? Uh, I tell my machine learning algorithm, okay, uh, the strength has to be extremely high. Please, uh, you remember that. So when I say, the, say that, then that means the probability of a machine learning algorithm assigning very high values of W is very high, right? So... Uh, because uh, the machine learning algorithm has to assign very large values of w so that your constraint is satisfied so that is explained via this probability distribution uh, i would try to keep this in uh, simpler words right so uh, say uh, i would straight away want the users to concentrate here so and the x value is uh, the value that w can take right so uh, say around here uh, the value of w is extremely high and around to the tail of this gaussian the value of w is very low and we observe that for this particular value of w there is a peak right uh, there is a peak density if i have to be extremely technical so what what does that mean it means you have high probability of observing w1 values that are very high so say for example you uh, you do the machine learning algorithm and you finish the machine learning algorithm and see, you see you run the machine learning algorithm 100 different times 99 uh, for for 99 times the machine the machine would have assigned very high values of w1 and w2 and for that one single time alone it would have assigned a low value right so that is essentially what uh, 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 the probability uh, of this uh, of weights uh, being told uh, means so for the computer science students this is uh, this actually sounds strikingly familiar because you have uh, something right and i'm pro and i'm providing you a, pr a prior information on what on what that something has to be this is actually quite similar to a posteriori estimation right because you 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 are providing a prior so that uh, you know the probability distribution of the weights right so uh, in in some sense we can uh, even move to maximum a posteriori estimate from this explanation right so if i have to be even more uh, uh, topic oriented this is how you would uh, typically do go about that you would say that the strength is very high and that is the formulation of an actual uh, prior information being given to the model right okay so uh, another way of looking at uh, things the the exact same thing right so the the temperature of the nozzle uh, is the input and the output is the strength of the final part and uh, say uh, assume that uh, 
you have developed the machine learning algorithm and you ask your computer hey machine learning i give you this temperature what is the corresponding strength right so you are actually checking if the algorithm does surprisingly good or actually good or bad right so this word i give you the temperature what is the corresponding strength can be beautifully formulated in terms of conditional probability what is the probability that strength would take this value given that temperature has been taken as an input or in other words what is the probability of strength given that uh, temperature has taken this value so this is an essentially conditional value right okay so what again i have to uh, resort to probability distribution so uh, this is the value of uh, uh, strength right so these are the different values of uh, 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 strength that would take so this is the original uh, probability distribution of what the strength would have been if you give that particular uh, input right so what the machine learning algorithm does is it tries to sort of uh, recreate this entire original probability distribution so your end goal is to uh, approximate the original um, probability distribution and after doing that uh, it would uh, it would identify this peak value uh, the peak value is what would occur right and uh, since uh, the machine learning's uh, uh, probability distribution peak kind of matches the original probability distribution peak then we can uh, say that the machine learning algorithm is performing quite well for those of you who did not understand this yes no worries right i can explain this in even more simpler terms in other words the original value of the strength is say for example 550 units you know because you are an expert in 3d printing for the temperature 35 kelvin and you want the machine to find out the exact same thing so uh, you run the machine learning algorithm uh, nine, uh, 100 times, right? For 99 times, it predicts value of 150. And for that one single time alone, it doesn't predict. Or in other words, the machine learning algorithm would predict the strength as 150 units for 99% of the time. Why, why is it predicting 99% of the time? Because it has estimated... Uh, the probability this conditional probability distribution in such a way that it resembles the actual probability distribution right so this is actually an interesting way of uh, viewing things so uh, this is actually quite uh, <clears throat> uh practical in most of the senses the reason why i'm using probability is because uh in real world uh something as vague as 3d printing uncertainties are there and you need to model uncertainties right so uh, so uh, this is the essential meaning of uh, the conditional probability distribution or estimating the probability distribution so if i run the machine learning algorithm 100 times 99 percent of uh, 99 times it would actually predict the correct value and only one single time only uh, it would not uh, uh, predict the, the correct value, right? So this is the conditional probability distribution, right? So to summarize, uh, finding out the conditional probability distribution is actually analogous to supervised learning. You have the input as well as the output features and what exactly is non-supervised learning? Finding out the probability distribution of both input and output itself altogether is known as unsupervised learning uh, let me give an uh, example right so this is a a joint probability distribution and it is these are the marginals right marginals of say x and y so what were a machine learning algorithm would uh, typically have the have is the set of uh, clustered data points that doesn't even make any sense at all so from this set of clustered data points so if i have to say um make this so in sort of a, a 2d a three-dimensional uh, uh, a two-dimensional figure so this were this would be a joint probability distribution with uh, the intensity being very high at this center me meaning that it has a very high peak so this is uh, this would be the information given uh, to the computer and uh, uh, to the algorithm we can sort of say that it tries to predict uh, this marginal x and y which is not earlier uh, known to it right so again and this is 
based on an abuse of notation. So this is not a final understanding, but what uh, the final understanding would mean that in supervised uh, uh, learning, you would uh, use conditional probability distribution, or you would uh, approximate or try to find out P of Y given X, right? And uh, <clears throat> the output can be anything. So if uh, so, since strength is a continuous variable, uh, and the uh, the PDF would be continuous, and uh, the probability distribution function is continuous. Sorry, the probability density function, right, is continuous. And uh, if, I, if I have a discrete uh, output, say for example, defective or non-defective, you would have something called the probability mass function, right? And for unsupervised learning you are finding out the essential probability distributions themselves, right? So to conclude with, uh, uh, yes, the basic definition of uh, machine learning, uh, the traditional way of, uh, uh, yes, uh, here the traditional refers to, in our case, the ugly differential equations. So you have the temperature input and uh, you uh, you plug in that temperature input into that huge differential equation and uh, you get output as to whether clogging would happen or not in some sense. In machine learning, you would have both the input, say the temperature of the nozzle, and you would also have the output, clogging has happened. And a simple uh, machine learning algorithm would uh, uh, provide you answer in similar terms. This is again 3D printing in simpler terms, stack of uh, stack up papers on top of each other. You have a cuboid. And in real time, in interestingly, bricklaying of houses is example uh, is quite similar to 3D printing, right? Because essentially a single brick on a macro scale is, is a 2D object for us. But uh, if, you, if you build uh, bricks uh, on top of each other, it forms a house, which is a 3D object, right? That is again, another way of seeing at things. And yet another example is the maps, the contour maps. Right, you have thin slices of 2D layers stacked on top of each other to represent uh, uh, hills, valleys. Right, so yes, and uh, machine learning for 3D printing. Uh, the way how I define the machine learning is that uh, <clears throat> uh, machine learning essentially finds out the relationship uh, between input and output. Right, feel free to choose your own uh, poison. Uh, feel free to choose your own version of input and output, just make sure that uh, they are numbers, right? Because machine learning uh, is essentially modification of uh, numbers, right? And uh, you have to be extremely careful because gathering of the data in, in any part of this, um, this process flow is actually extremely difficult, as I mentioned before. So if I have to be even more uh, elaborate, and yes, uh, yes, uh, I know I am uh, nearing my time. Uh, I just require two more minutes to finish, right? So yes, uh, in uh, just to give an anecdotal example, I worked with this large machine called powder bed fusion machine or for metal additive manufacturing. I need to wait at least four hours to print a cube of one centimeter, right? So uh, that is the essential uh, difficulty in order to do something as trivial as printing a cube of one centimeter. So the pre-processing setup itself took uh, say one to two hours and, uh, uh, and the post-processing would take another uh, uh, solid chunk of minutes because the entire process happens in such a way that it is actually quite difficult. So for the ones who want to uh, do machine learning, what I would want to do is uh, uh, give the respect that uh, the, the data gathering requires. And uh, apart from gathering data, you also need to be well versed in uh, uh, pre-processing the data, right? Uh, one uh, <clears throat> challenge that you might face is getting uh, different kinds of uh, data, visual inputs, temperature inputs, etc., etc., etc. You need to normalize that correctly, and you also need to uh, have filters for various sensors, right? And uh, not every sensor is the ideal utopian good one. Uh, every sensor has faults uh, inbuilt, and hence uh, you need to be aware of that, and hence. The reason that it is quite difficult uh, to gather this amount of data, I would say uh, for the machine learning people enthusiast uh, to employ a sort of a Bayesian approach because Bayesian approach normally talks about abnormalities and uncertainties in quite a good way, right?
Okay, so yes, uh, 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 the, the default ways of finding out relationships are quite difficult under most circumstances, but this is an important point. When you feel like you don't need machine learning algorithm, rather you can ask your friend who is an expert in 3D printing or even yourself, don't try to use machine learning because machine learning seems to be an extremely overcomplicated task for something that you already know. Because as I mentioned before of this part, uh, in order to do a machine learning algorithm, you need to have data capturing devices, which is quite difficult, right? Yes. So coming to the future scope, I mentioned about machine learning models, right? Machine learning models uh, take inputs from the data and uh, the data are the gods to them. And uh, traditional models, uh, they have the governing laws, say Ohm's law, uh, heat transfer law, et cetera, et cetera. And, and even say, for example, uh, even in uh, economics for the computer science people, you have the production functions, game theory, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, those are the physical laws and you ask the help of that law in order to give you uh, outputs. And uh, I might claim that in future, something called the physics informed neural networks would uh, uh, take place. Physics informed neural networks essentially combines both uh, how a machine learning would work and it also requires uh, the help of uh, the domain, right? So uh, it is basically you trying out uh, machine learning on uh, 3D printing. So what you essentially do is you work with the data and subsequently you refer the data to an expert and you also ask his opinion, right? So uh, you validate both of that and build your data, right? So that is uh, sort of an, uh, I, I wouldn't say an exciting future, but something that we can look forward to because physics informed neural networks for practical applications like uh, 3D printing uh, is a long way to come because the traditional model themselves are quite scary, right? So yeah, uh, that sort of uh, concludes my uh, uh, discussion on uh, this topic. So yes, uh, I would like to thank the students and uh, I would like to apologize for the extra two minutes, right? So yes, if, if I have to uh, implement the uncertainty here, I started my stop clock a uh, few seconds after the presentation. And for those of you who, sec uh, who started their stop clock, stop clock exactly during the presentation, you have an uncertainty, right? Yes, there you go. More motivation for you to be an Bayesian enthusiast, right? Uh, yes, okay. Um, yes, and uh, that is all there and I'll stop presenting and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, very nice presentation, Arvind. Thank uh, you. Actually, man. I don't expect this much machine learning concepts need to be included inside this 3D printing. We thought 3D mm. printing is <laughs> ultimately <clears throat> for designers. <laughs> mm. So maybe it's very, uh, very good for us to see yes. how much we are helping in any field. <laughs> yes, yeah, ma'am. I mean, I mean. How you managed totally from uh, mechanical engineering, you moved to this machine learning. How you managed uh, uh, the experience, it will be helpful for the persons who are not in computer science field who are attending right. this. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, so that they can get yes, ma'am. So, yes, ma'am. So, uh, uh, so the first thing is, um, get excited about uh, machine learning is the first thing uh, that i would uh, want to say to anyone right so um, if you get excited potentially about any new topics that you want to learn you would find yourself exploring the topic more often than not so that is one thing and uh, the second thing is uh, making sure that you you grasp your fundamentals to such an extent and uh, that um, you can understand uh, the machine learning uh, coding uh, part, right? So, and uh, I have to be actually 
careful here uh, because <clears throat> as someone uh, from a, a mechanical department, uh, my focus was not at all on uh, the coding aspects, right? Uh, because uh, the coding makes it practically easy for uh, any 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 person uh, to implement machine learning. All they need to do is uh, uh, <clears throat> just type uh, uh, import numpy as np and then type some some np dot an and something and it all does it for you, right? So that is something that I wouldn't endorse. Uh, again, um, for those of you who uh, who are not into machine learning, right? So this is something that I would say. What I would uh, rather say is uh, get to know the math uh, behind the machine learning, because um, the math behind the machine learning has helped people uh, from across all the engineering domain, even the science domain and the economics domain, etc., so on and so forth. And the math behind the machine learning has been in existence for almost 70 to 80 years. Uh, namely, say, for example, the mckellar pitts model of the uh, multi-layer perceptron was actually formulated in 1950s, right? So that is almost extremely as old as it could get when uh, the mathematical concepts for uh, engineering uh, topics uh, were, uh, were being formulated. So the only reason people earlier couldn't uh, proceed further is because uh, the computations were actually quite extremely complex and they don't they didn't have the computational power uh, to do that and that is actually made quite possible uh, nowadays as i mentioned in my lectures uh, in my thing we have uh, hpc computing so uh, that is again and uh, the other thing so thirdly if i have to elaborate more on the math that is being um, needed i would like to uh, the non uh, the non machine learning people to appreciate and the story that goes on uh, behind the math, being it uh, linear algebra. I mentioned a lot about the probability because uh, of, of my interest too. So uh, linear algebra, probability, uh, calculus, etc., so on and so forth. So uh, when you try to understand uh, the definitions and when you try to visualize the math that goes behind machine learning, you would actually be amazed at how good the math is. And you would actually be even more amazed that these ideas actually came around the 1970s or 1960s. And uh, it is not even such of a recent concept that we outside machine learning would normally think of. Right? So, um, so those are the three things that I would suggest. And uh, we have to mention sort of the reading materials that I used. Um, if you want to consider yourself as someone uh, who is good in machine learning, you have to solve uh, the problems at the end of the book uh, chapters called uh, uh, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by Christopher Bishop. I guess that is an extremely popular book. And if you can solve the problems at the end of uh, those chapters, then you can actually claim that uh, you have a fundamental uh, grasping of that. And uh, yes, uh, that is one thing that um, I, I would, uh, I mean, in, in my personal experience, that is how I would define a metric uh, in, in sort of, uh, in order to judge myself as someone who is um, good uh, so, uh, in machine learning, because I feel like machine learning is such a rapidly expanding field and uh, uh, when we get to know about the fundamentals uh, rather than uh, the codes, uh, since we know the fundamentals, we can start building on those um, fundamentals in order to get a grasp of what is being done. And yes, secondly, and uh, thirdly, I would say this is sort of an, uh, an pure interest of mine. So that interest arose uh, by me watching uh, NPTEL lectures, right? And yes, I admit that NPTEL lectures can are quite boring, but uh, what I did is I found out the correct NPTEL lecture or the correct video lecture for me. So I wouldn't uh, say that every NPTEL lecture is good sometimes. I mean, it depends from one, P one person to another person. Find uh, uh, your correct lecture that talks about uh, the mathematical preliminaries, right? And uh, uh, I, uh, it, uh, I, sta I sat be behind my computer and I took around four to five days just to understand what Bayes' theorem actually means, right? So what it uh, typically means and what are the implications. And uh, when I started exploring about Bayes' theorem, I got to know about this cult, right? 
uh, we have uh, so many historical uh, cults and uh, i i get, i got to know about uh, the people who follow bayesian version of probability and the people who follow frequentist version of uh, probability so so when i get to appreciate the lore and the stories behind uh, the machine learning formulations it actually piqued to my uh, interest right so yeah <laughs> sorry ma'am this is sort of a huge explanation <laughs> Yeah, no issues. You have a lot of experience, right? So, so. I would say I have a lot of enthusiasm, ma'am. So I'm, I'm still <laughs> learning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. Any other questions? Yeah. Swati, you can close. If no questions. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And uh, yes, uh, thank you to the panel for observing or listening to this lecture. And yes, uh, hopefully uh, I will meet uh, you all soon, the near or the far future. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Once again, good evening, all. I want to express my heartfelt appreciation to each and every one of you for your participation in the Alumni Tech Series on AI. Your involvement and active engagement have truly elevated this event, making it both special and unforgettable. We extend our deep gratitude to our esteemed alumni, Mr. Aravind C, for gracing us with his presence and sharing his invaluable insights. Your words have undoubtedly ignited inspiration among us all. A big thanks goes out to our professors, whose guidance and support have been instrumental throughout this event, as well as to the dedicated organizing team for their unwavering efforts in ensuring the success of this occasion. To our fellow alumni, your contributions and shared experiences have enriched our discussions, providing depth and valuable perspectives. Your pres presence has been truly priceless. Lastly, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to all the attendees. Thank you, sir. And let's carry on with our exploration of the captivating domain of AI in unison. Thank you.